Uh, our guest today, Colin Sumrall, got his bachelor's degree magna cum laude from Arizona State University, then went on to the University of Texas for his master's degree and his doctorate. Uh, he uh, served at the Cincinnati Museum Center as curator and department head of invertebrate paleontology before coming to the U University of Tennessee in 2002 as a lecturer in earth and planetary sciences. He became an as uh, assistant professor in 2012, an associate professor in 2017, and throughout that period of time, he has been racking up awards and I'm gonna concentrate on the teaching awards. He has won the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. He has won four times the Outstanding Teaching Award from his department, Earth and Planetary Sciences. He has won the Bill Ross Faculty Achievement Award. Uh, so a remarkable teacher, but a no less remarkable researcher. He has been principal investigator, co-principal investigator, or senior personnel for National Science Foundation grants that have brought more than five and a half million dollars to the University of Tennessee. He has done field work in Siberia, Argentina, Spain, Italy, and all over the United States. That's just field work. That's not all the places that he has given uh, invited speeches on his specialty. And he talks to us today on that very specialty. Here is Colin Sumrall talking about the astonishing architecture of fossil starfish, awesome at any scale. Thanks, Mark. Now with any luck, it'll go. Okay, well, thanks for coming, everybody. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is my, my animals of specialty, which are called echinoderms, the most regu easily recognizable for most people being the starfish. And I wanna sort of show you why these organisms are interesting across all kinds of scales. Everything from the large massive scale down to the atomic scale. With that, what is an echinoderm? Well, within the modern world, we have several groups of echinoderms that are alive today. Uh, this is a sea star. This is called a crinoid or a sea lily. This is an, a brittle star or an ophiroid. This is an echinoid or a sea urchin. Sand dollars are also part of this group. And this is a sea cucumber. This is what they look like in nature. That's a sea urchin. Sea urchins are very important animals, not only for um, their roles in, in the reef, which is largely as the cleaners of reefs. They eat a lot of the algae that you see on the reef, but they also are bioeroders, tearing the reef apart with their teeth, which we'll look at later. They're really interesting. Sea cucumbers are great sediment churners. They, they eat sediment and, and pass it through their digestive system, processing all the organic matter out of it. Sea stars take on a variety of roles, filter feeders, deposit feeders, and carnivores. The same is true for the brittle stars. They are the most speciose group of all echinoderms and one that I've gotten a special fondness for in the last couple of years. And then finally, crinoids. These are the dominant um, group of echinoderms prior to about 250 million years ago, where they are the major rock former of lots of different rock units across the world. Weird looking animals, very different, but what do they all have in common? Well, they all have this strange system called a water vascular system. It's sort of like nature's hydraulics. It's a water system through the body that they use to operate appendages that are used for feeding, locomotion, things like that. 
there's a general five partishness to them. They they often have the body arranged radially into five different directions. They have a complicated internal skeleton made of up to millions of little tiny pieces called called skeletal elements or ossicles or plates that have a very special microstructure that is microporous in single crystals. And although the name means spiny skin, only a few taxa have spines, but those happen to be the ones that are alive today. So this is a close up of a lab made of mine. Uh, these are the tube feet right here, these kind of weird things with these little suckers on them. And these are spines and this is a sea urchin. So this is what the tube feet do. This is a, an asteroid, a starfish walking around and you see that the tube feet are, are helping it walk. It's their little suckers and they use them to walk around. And the ones up here are actually used for sensing. So they're, they're smelling the water for what they might want in terms of food or what have you. Fivishness is very common. Sometimes it's a little hard to see, but this uh, sea urchin, you can see there's a ray going down. There's one over here, one over here, one over here, and one over here. And that's a feature that we see in nearly all modern groups of echinoderms. Again, here's a starfish showing the same sort of thing, five rays. But also notice that the skeleton is made up of a bunch of little tiny pieces. And if you actually let this animal die and decay, that's what you're left with. A good sized starfish, you can calculate the number of, of little plates it has, and it can be over a million. And so the fossil record of echinoderms is largely the fossil record of sand. Echinoderms are things that we see within our society more often than people um, probably realize. Not only do we have exciting memes about starfish, I kind of like that one, but there are many different toys for children, for dogs that are, that are starfish because a starfish is a very interesting animal that, that a lot of people are introduced to very early on. Our clothing. My son had this when he was a child. I have this shirt. These are both echinoderm related shirts. Echinoderms have been used in, in several cultures to decorate graves. There's a Bronze Age grave where the entire grave is, is lined with sea urchins which is kind of interesting. And they've been used as art. Here's a cherub that's riding a sea urchin chariot being pulled by sea cucumbers. And then my student Aidan Sweeney drew this, which I think is fabulous. It's a ship being killed by a Kraken brittle star. <laughs> Echinoderms are food. A lot of cultures eat them very regularly. In fact, in South America, there's a huge horticulture of sea urchins. And this is, you crack open a sea urchin and this is the gonads and you eat the gonads. But that's, that's what sea urchin food is. And then sea cucumbers are also heavily harvested from the sea and, and used in cuisine. There's also um, interest in how echinoderms are put together from architects. A colleague of mine in Germany has been working with architects trying to put echinoderm design and echinoderm themes into architecture. And this is one of their creations. It's a little pavilion based on sea urchins and how a sea urchin is put together. Here's Strong Hall, the newly reconstructed Strong Hall. 
Why do I bring this up? All this white rock that you see up here, here, and this entire annex where the classrooms are is made of Indiana limestone. In Indiana limestone, if you look at it carefully, you see all the little sand grains. Almost all of those sand grains are echinoderms. In fact, echinoderm rock is used in building stones across the world. So echinoderms are very, very important. Now, as a paleontologist, when I look at echinoderm rock, I'm always a little sad because what we wanna see is not this. We wanna see cool fossils like this. Echinoderm fossils are actually very rare in the fossil record for the most part because they do fall apart so readily. You can see how many pieces these have, but they include a lot of things that are quite recognizable today. So for example, um, this is called a disasteroid. I know it's a terrible name, but disasteroids are very closely related to a lot of our sea biscuits that are common fossils that we see in Florida, for example, today, or common animals we see in Florida. And here's a fossil brittle star that is completely recognizable as a brittle star with the little disc in the middle and the long snake-like arms coming off. And sometimes echinoderms have interesting connections. This particular specimen is named after, I believe it's the great grandfather, or I might have missed or gained a generation of Tom Broadhead, who is, who is um, over in the college as a, a recruiter. But he was a former paleontologist in our department, and this fossil, Pentromides broadhead eye, is named after his family. But then the real fun begins. The, the types of echinoderms I've been working on for 25 years are what are called the weird and unusual echinoderms. They look like this, all kinds of strange things. And this has led to a lot of problems in trying to interpret these animals. And it's largely because we hadn't had a really good idea how all of these little pieces fit together into a coherent understanding of their morphologies. A lot of these animals live in, or all of these animals live in communities and those communities can show us all sorts of interesting interactions like this particular echinoderm lives on the stems of other echinoderms. These tri this trilobite is carrying a host of of other echinoderms on its back. Was it using it for camouflage? I'm not sure, but this type of interaction we see in the fossil record. And, and when echinoderms become parts of communities and those communities fall apart, we are left with rock. That is the direct result of the interactions of organisms within those communities. And a rock like this to a trained eye is over 95% grains of these animals, the echinoderms. So they are important animals from that perspective on the community level. Now, when you look at an echinoderm, it's easy to get overwhelmed by just how many little bits there are. And I've spent a lot, long time looking at little bits. And when you look at echinoderms from that little bits perspective, it's easy to, to lose sight of commonality over differences. So for example, these two animals, I think it doesn't take you know, a great deal of training to look at them and say, those don't look anything alike. Those are very, very different looking things. But within the echinoderm scientific community, there's even a more fundamental problem. And that is, in order to understand these animals, we have to understand how the parts are the same among different types of fossils. So for example, if, if I were to, to look at a human being and point to an upper arm and say the bone there is a humerus, I would need to know what a humerus looks like, not only in a human being, but in a horse, in a tyrannosaurus, in a frog. 
we've never had that understanding before with any kind of derms. And on top of that, to make matters even worse, echinoderms were first studied by different people in different countries speaking different languages. The net result is sometimes we have the identical two elements that are not the same part in different organisms, but they have exactly the same name. We also have pieces that are exactly the same part, but have different names in different organisms. And the third one is even actually happens as well. There are organisms where non-identical parts are given the same name in the same organisms. Now, if you're trying to sort this out, this has become hugely problematic. And I'll just give you an example of, of why understanding that architecture of how these are put together can be so important. These two animals were classified in the same group, blastoidea, because they have deltoid plates. And deltoid plate simply means triangle plate. This one, it's this plate. This one, it's this plate. So you classify them together because there's a triangular plate called a deltoid. The problem is if you look at it from which element is which, the, the red plate in this animal is the same piece as the red plate in this animal. And this blue plate, which has the same name as this plate, is actually not the same plate. So you see how complicated this can actually get. A recent sorting out of all these morphologies called universal elemental homology has helped to straighten a lot of this out. And, and it sort of looks like this. If you, the plates that form the mouth itself are colored in red. The plates that form early embryologically and cover that mouth are in blue. The plates that hold the water vascular system and the feeding appendages are colored in green. And then the plates that cover that water vascular system are covered, are colored in tan. And if we can understand how that system works in a model organism, we can then expand it to all organisms. So for example, this animal, we would say which, which plates actually form the mouth orifice. And through detailed anatomical study, we can decide it's those. Which plates cover that mouth or orifice? Those. Which plates house the water vascular system? Those. And then which pieces cover it? Those. And so by doing this detailed anatomy and understanding that architectural construction of the organism, we are able to then make them orderly and therefore understandable. And that's what the model looks like. Now to show you why this could be useful, once you have this model worked out, you can then use it in a comparative sense. So here's three different animals that are somewhat closely related. And all those pieces are, all the pieces that are identical are colored the same color. So the ones forming the edge of the mouth are these red ones and they all have them in the same positions. The blue ones cover that mouth, but notice how different the blue ones are in these three taxa. So that's information we can use to help understand how these organisms are put together. The green ones on this animal are actually free appendages that sit out in the water column and are not preserved. Where on these animals, they're actually part of the body wall of the animal. So, so again, all of these details help us to understand how these organisms are related. They can also show us evolutionary transformations. Here's a, here's a transformation series in crinoids. And what I want you to look at is these blue elements, small blue elements that aren't in contact, blue elements that are in contact, blue elements that are much larger, and then blue elements that dominate. So we can just see this transition series, which is a really powerful tool to understand how these organisms are related and, and put together. And then again, another group, blastoid, showing a similar thing, but here look at the red plates. 
Here, the red plates are small and in the corner. And here, the entire body is made of the red plates. So these sorts of features are what are used by the community to understand the interrelatedness of these taxa. So it's not only the architecture of knowing what part is what, but echinoderms have another feature that makes them, in terms of the way they're constructed, that makes them really interesting to study. And that is, if you look at them in detail, you can be overwhelmed by the sheer number of pieces. I mean, I mean, let's just zoom in on this thing. This is the top of that central disc. Every little knob is a piece. And, and you flip it over to look at the mouth and look at all this detail. You've got all the weird apparatus of the mouth in here. You have, you have all these little spines coming off. Look at the body. That, that leathery body is made of thousands of little tiny plates that are then covered with tiny little spines and so on and so on and so on. That's easy to overwhelm you. But if you look at it in detail, it's serially homologous. There are, there are repeating patterns that we see that help make sense of it. So on the arm, a segment has one of these pieces that's, a, that's called a ventral shield. There's a, two pieces over here where the, where the tube foot comes out. There's a series of spines. There's two lateral arm plates and so on and so on and so on. And each segment has those same pieces. So by, by understanding that serial homology, we can then understand the animal as a whole. Because otherwise, you're just left with that, and who wants to deal with that? <laughs> so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a couple of, 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 of instances where we can see these sorts of things. So this is what a brittle star might look like. And you see that there, we have the same serially repeating pieces, the ventral shield, the lateral arm plates, the spines, the vertebrae, and then the dorsal shield plates up here. So that's what, a, that's what a ventral shield plate would look like. And they're all basically the same shape. They change a little bit from the front end of the arm to the back end of the arm, but the general pattern is that's what they look like. They have little notches here where the, where the two feet stick out and so on. This is one of the vertebrae elements. Starfish are invertebrates, but uh, they have vertebrae in this group. And they're called that because they have that same basic morphologies. But, but here, the, the morphology, the, the way these are put together, their architectural construction helps us understand the animal. So for example, that's a ball and socket joint with that being the ball and then there's a socket on the back end. So that construction helps us see how these animals are put together. And then this is what a lateral arm plate looks like in detail. And notice that it's not a very simple thing. It's actually quite complicated. There's three regions. On the back end of the plate, there's this region, which has this really coarse microstructure that's wide open with these funny little things here. These funny things are spine bases. That's what the spine's attached to. That smooth surface and that dense surface on them is to help that articulation work very well. You know, you don't want a really porous, rough surface where a joint is taking place. So that smoothness is part of, part of that. This region here, with that sort of dense with large holes, is basically the outer surface of the animal. And then this surface here with the open gallery microstructure is, is an internal surface. We'll look at that in some detail in a moment. Bottom line though is based on what you can see in a modern taxon, we can then apply this to the fossil record because fossil brittle stars have these same parts. 
So this is a new fauna that we've been working on from, oh, 350 million year old shales in Kentucky. And if you look at this particular piece here, these are all those lateral arm plates. You see the spine basis. You see that dense microstructure right here for the outside of the body. And you see that open microstructure where the plate extends to the interior of the body. And you can see the same thing on these other plates as well. So using that ar the architectural tools from the modern, we can then move into the past and see these same basic gross plate morphologies. Here's what that microstructure looks like up close. This microstructure is only found in echinoderms. No other group has anything even remotely like it. And what's even weirder about this is that is a single crystal. Most microstructured or organisms' microstructures are, are sort of inline crystal patterns. You know, just lots of little crystals all lined up. This is a single crystal with that really complicated microstructure. And if you look at an element like this vertebra, you'll notice that the microstructure varies all over it. And that's because different types of soft tissues are attached to different portions of these, of these plates. And so the way the holes are arranged, the way the holes are laid out, the size of the pore mesh in the holes is all related to the function of the plate and allows us to interpret what's going on very precisely. So this is a sea urchin and that sea urchin has knobs that the spine base is attached to the, and it's built just like a trailer hitch. It's a perfect ball and socket joint. And so the spine can move in any direction. Little muscles attach to the base of the spine over here and those muscles attach right here. So if you pull on the right side, the plate moves to the right. And if you pull on the left side, the plate moves to the left. But the details of the architecture of the microstructure in the spines actually helps us interpret how this works. This is the base of a spine. You can see it has this open gallery work here with this really dense microstructure here to give this element some strength. And then the muscles attach down here. And that's what that looks like. The muscle fibers go into all of those little holes and that deep penetration into those holes help it have a strong uh, holding onto the plate so it can be moved in any direction. Here's the growing tip of that same spine. Um, you can see that open gallery network here of little holes, that really, really dense surface here. And that's, that's how the animal's adding new material onto this piece as it gets larger and larger. It's very interesting growth patterns. This is the very tip top of a sea urchin. That's the anal opening. And over here, we have a special piece called a madreporite. The madreporite is the water intake for that water vascular system. And you can see that this, this microstructure looks quite different than in the same place on these other four elements. That's what it looks like in detail. It's a series of pipes. And it, it's there to sieve out any debris or small organisms from the water so it doesn't foul the inside of the body. But again, that microstructure is unique to that madreporite system, and it's used for uh, filtering out water. And then we can also learn a lot about how organisms are put together, again, with comparative anatomy. This is a sea urchin I found after a fox had eaten it in Alaska, the kind of thing that happens to me. And 
that weird thing right there is called Aristotle's lantern. That is, the, it was described by Aristotle and it's the mouth apparatus of a sea urchin. Here's what it looks like in detail. There's five teeth, this thing, held in these little V-shaped things called pyramids that then act as individual jaws. So it has five jaw elements that it uses to bite through stuff. Again, using a modern template, you can find these in the fossil record. These again are 350 million year old uh, parts of an Aristotle's lantern. These funny pieces here are these pyramids right here. This piece here with the long striations is the, the actual tooth. These funny pieces right here are that one and that one. And then these funny little weird shaped elements here are these pieces right here. So we can, we can identify all these pieces, understanding the microstructure to tell us how the musculature works, how, and the microstructure also telling us what those various pieces are used for. As you might imagine, the tooth element itself is going to need to be very, very hard. So we would expect it to have very little porousness in its microstructure. This is the growing end of it. And you can see it starts out with this really weird, complex microstructure. But as it gets more and more mature and more material is secreted onto it, it becomes a very strong composite, very dense structure. And that's ideal for, for those tooth elements so that they can actually grind through rock. The microstructure also gives us a lot of clues about how the brittle star arms articulate. So this is one of those lateral arm plates. And we talked about the spine bases attaching on the side over here. We talked about this being the external surface of the body and then this being the internal surface. But if you want to see how it articulates, you need a couple of them. So we put, we put another one on and another one on. And now you can kind of see how that arm is constructed. It has a fringe of spines for every segment. And then that, that dense stereome on the side, the dense microstructure on the side is completely external. And this coarse open microstructure over here allows those plates to be articulated to one another with a flexible articulation, but still a very strong articulation. So that whole thing wraps together. And then if we look in detail at these spine bases, you can see all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. Note this dense material is where the spine attaches. This open material is where the connective tissues that move the spine are articulated. And then we have a nerve and a uh, muscle hole right here. Knowing that, we can now look at our 350 million year old fossils. Oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. There's the spine. <laughs> Brittle star spines are not very big. Um, and you can see that spine is built of this open mesh here that finer mesh here for the muscle attachments and then the really smooth surface so it can move around that articulating surface. This is one of our old fossils. And hopefully you can see that everything I just described is here. There, here's that dense outer surface of the animal right here, that really dense, very few holes part. Here are the three spine bases. Here's that dense part where the spine sits and the, the two holes, the nerve hole and the muscle hole. And then that open gallery network where the connective tissues would lie. So it's built exactly the same. It's just much, much older. So the microstructure is a very, very fine scale of 
of pattern that we see within these animals. But there's even one more scale that's, e that's also very important. I'll call your attention to these structures right here, these little crystals. This is a mineral called dolomite. Dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. The, ana the, the echinoderm is made of a mineral that is almost exactly the same called calcite, which is only different in that calcite doesn't have the magnesium in it. But crystalline structure is exactly the same. The echinoderm itself is made of each plate is one single crystal. So while this may be one single crystal, everything you see here with that microstructure is also a single crystal, which is absolutely bizarre when you think about it. Here is a fossil echinoderm plate that has broken. You can see the whole plate is like this, and that shiny surface right there is the cleavage plane. It's, it's when you break the crystal and it has that shiny face, that's that shiny planar face on the calcite crystal. This is what calcite looks like in the, in the real world. You know, it's a, it's a great big, what's called rhombohedron with, uh, it's like a cube, but squished a bit. And then calcite grows in a wide variety of forms. You know, there's a thing called a scalenohedron and so on and, and these sorts of structures. But the reason calcite is the shape it is, is because it has an organization and an architecture at even a finer level, and that's the atomic level. Calcite is a trigonal crystal made up of a crystalline lattice. And when you build this lattice on top of itself, you wind up with beautiful calcite crystals. So from, you can think about it as this, you start out with a crystal and that's the finest detail of architecture that's important for any kind of derm because all of its pieces are made of this mineral calcite. That calcite grows in crystals that are templated by the actual organism itself. All the holes are full of the soft tissue, the, the meat of the animal, if you will. And that single calcite crystal grows within that, within that tissue to make this really interesting and elaborate shape. That shape is then fashioned into a functional plate of the animal that carries on some type of function, like it might be a spine, that it might be a, a plate for the madreporite, or it might be part of the arm. All of those pieces then with their, with their interesting shapes are then glued together by the organism into an, a single body that allows that organism to thrive with its, in its environment. And the way it's put together as paleontologists helps us understand what those organisms are. Those organisms then build communities of sometimes they're one species like this case with Jimbacrinus from Australia. Other times they're really diverse communities and those diverse communities make up rocks and those rocks are then quarried and made into buildings that serve our society. So here's a Christmas tree. It's actually my Christmas tree with its little echinoderm shot. But I think the bottom line is you can appreciate echinoderms at multiple levels, no matter what, what you're interested in. And with that, I will leave it there and answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much.